In 2013, two kids named Timothy Brooks and Neil Scott had dreams of becoming drug kingpins. They both had recently graduated from Haverford High School, a prestigious $35,000 a year private school located in the suburbs of Philadelphia, with alums including Olympic athletes, award-winning actors, and more. It was one of the finest academic institutions in the country, and these two guys wanted to control every single drug being sold there. Through strategic Strategic planning, greed, and threats, the duo grew their operation from a small-time hustle into a full-blown drug ring, recruiting numerous high schoolers and college students to push their product. But their efforts didn't end at Haverford. They set their sights on dominating the entire Philadelphia suburban drug market, targeting numerous local high schools and colleges in the process. But as their ambitions grew, so did the risks, risks that eventually spiraled into one of the most shocking drug busts in private school history. The township of Haverford is a tranquil one, to say the least. With a population of just over 6,500 engulfed in its tree-lined streets, well-maintained lawns, and family-friendly atmosphere, most would consider it the perfect place to raise a family. But this safe, idealistic neighborhood doesn't come without a cost. The average annual income of a household in Haverford is over 266 grand. Pair that with an average home price of around $1.2 million, and it's clear that every kid in this neighborhood has a cocaine addiction. Okay, that's a joke, but the families that live here are pretty above average in terms of wealth, which makes it the perfect place for an institution like Haverford. Haverford High School. This prestigious all-boys prep school is known as one of the finest high schools in the country and has produced all-star humans like gold medal Olympians, MLB players, actors, singers, Super Bowl champions, congressmen, Ivy League professors, and more. It's highly regarded by families within the township as it boasts a strong sense of local pride, active community involvement, and excellent schooling. Hence the price tag of $35,000 a year. And don't get me wrong, that's a shitload of money for just high school, but it seemed to be worth it for these parents, and especially their kids. One graduate claimed it was an absolutely incredible school to the point where it was perfect, a statement that a kid named Neil Scott would agree with. Despite this story taking place in the lavish Haverford Township, Neil actually grew up in a modest one-story home in Paoli, Pennsylvania, about a 19-minute drive from Haverford. His father, who was a carpenter, sent him to Conestoga High School, a way less expensive but very respectable high school. Here, he played lacrosse and was pretty good at it. So good, in fact, that Haverford recruited him on scholarship his junior year to play goalie for them. He started playing lacrosse and water polo while, of course, also receiving all the benefits of his new prestigious institution. To most of his classmates, he seemed like a typical high schooler, a funny, sarcastic kid who enjoyed the occasional toke and solo cup party. But but after he graduated in 2008, something changed in him. Whether it was the pressures of adult life creeping up on him, something going on at home, or whatever else, Neil was starting to become a different person. He attended Connecticut College fresh out of high school, and as you could have guessed, played the cross for them. But it seemed like he deteriorated from the all-star goalie he used to be. His teammates described him as a mediocre athlete at best, some even going as far as labeling him terrible. He would also get pissed off abnormally often. I remember him getting heated, like if you fucked with him or whatever, he would kind of snap. Neil stopped playing lacrosse after a single season and quickly engulfed himself in the typical college life of partying, smoking copious amounts of weed, and making fake IDs. Okay, you probably didn't make fake IDs in college, but if you did, thank you for your service. But Neil making fake IDs got him kicked out of school after just three semesters of attending, and he was left with nothing to do. With no concrete plan in mind, he moved to San Diego and stayed in in a bungalow on a beach to flee the drugs and trouble back home. Smart move to move to California when you're trying to get away from drugs. But thankfully, one of his old Haverford lacrosse coaches was able to get him a coaching job at the LAX West Lacrosse Program. He worked there for a little bit while also holding a job at a medical marijuana dispensary, so much for staying away from drugs, before moving to another coaching position, this time at a youth program. But like his college career, that didn't last long either. Only two months into the position, he cursed at a 10-year-old child, revealing his anger issues had stayed with him from college. After being fired, he once again fell into his old routine of being a druggie but this time with harder drugs like Xanax and other prescription pills. His boss at the youth program said it best. He started losing grip with reality. With seemingly all hope lost, Neil moved back to Philadelphia with absolutely no clue what his future held. 
Well, except for one idea. When he returned home by late fall of 2013, with no cash in his pockets, he hit up an old Haverford teammate, a guy named Stocky Euler, and pitched a genius money-making idea. Yo Stocky, it's Neil from Ageford. Just got back from Cali, got a bunch of greens. Know anyone around Philly who might be interests? Ha ha ha, yo brother, how are you? Like, wait? Doing pretty well, man. Yeah, got a lot of weight. Constant supply. Great numbers. So yeah, Neil's fantastic idea was to deal drugs. However, Stocky wasn't going to be Neil's partner in all of this. A kid named Timothy Brooks was. Timothy had a very different upbringing than Neil, and by different, I mean he was way more loaded. He grew up in Villanova, Pennsylvania, where there are wide, leafy streets, houses far enough apart to where you don't have to talk to your neighbors, and an average household income of over 400000 His father, who was an executive at a local HR firm, had more than enough means to afford Haverford High School for his son and it's safe to say his son enjoyed it thoroughly. Timothy was your typical cool kid type of guy at Haverford. He was the captain of the lacrosse team, played squash and golf on the side, and was super successful in anything he did. And to top off the persona, he hated school. If someone ever decides to write like Shakespeare again, they should be beat up. His gifted athletic abilities landed him a lacrosse scholarship at the University of Richmond, a school he claimed was everything he wanted. The school has a great academic reputation, is in a perfect region, and the campus is awesome. Life was perfect for Timothy, but less than a month into his freshman year at college, disaster struck. Like Neil, Timothy had to drop out of school almost as quickly as he got there, but not for the same reason. He sustained a terrible shoulder injury, an injury so bad that it required serious surgery in him to drop out of Richmond. This was a devastating blow to Timothy. Lacrosse was his identity, and he was so talented at the sport but this career-ending injury put him in a dark place. A place where he thought that dealing drugs with Neil was a fantastic idea. While sitting in his childhood bedroom, bored out of his mind, Timothy was desperate to earn some money to get out on his own. Even though he smoked in high school, he had never dealt drugs or shown interest in it at all, but him not having lacrosse anymore threw all logic out the window. It's not clear how Neil and Timothy got in contact. Maybe Neil hit up Timothy in the same way he did Stocky. But regardless of how they reconnected, they started to formulate a plan around the fall of 2013 to push some serious amounts of product. And I mean it when I say serious. Neil and Timothy weren't going to be the stereotypical college dropouts who slung dime bags to 16 year olds. No, they wanted to control the entire drug market within the Philadelphia suburbs, including all high schools and colleges. Timothy texted Scott, every nug on the main line is about to come from you and me. We will crush it. Once you go tax free, it's hard to go back. The main line that Timothy was talking about was the Philadelphia main line, a collection of 17 wealthy towns just west of Philadelphia that included Haverford and Villanova. Timothy named their newfound operation the Mainline Takeover Project, solidifying their ambition of becoming drug kingpins for the wealthy. But to have an operation this big, you need to have some sort of concrete plan. The duo knew this and started to plan out what the operation would look like, starting with defining their home base. They landed on using Neil's apartment, a cramped one-bedroom place on the second floor of a flimsy-looking rental house less than 900 feet from Haverford. It seemed like an okay spot, especially considering no one would ever go near it because it was quote, covered in like 500 dog turds, according to his neighbors. This is where pounds of weed from California would be shipped, thanks to Neil's connections, which he made from working in the dispensary. The duo would take this weed and repackage it for distribution while also dealing within the apartment, which was probably pretty clutch for Haverford students. I mean, they could literally stroll out a seventh period and be less than three football fields away from snagging some butt. But okay, the base of operations was set in stone. But how are they going to take over the main line's drug supply? It's not like they had any connections to the drug dealing world, so what would they do? Well, they utilized the only connections they had left the Haverford lacrosse team. You see, the elite school's lacrosse program was a tight-knit group. The powerhouse team thought of themselves as elite and had their own culture, a culture that was bound together by recreational drug use. A Haverford grad said, if you took one sport and said which one parties the most, it's the lacrosse guys. And the duo planned on fully utilizing that aspect of their bond to get their old teammates to deal drugs for them. Timothy and Neil's plan had them jittering with excitement. I mean, they both had similar stories, a great high school life, a dark turn post-graduation, and now a need for a sense of accomplishment. They had the motivation to accomplish something, but after they lost what they loved doing, they didn't know what that something could be. But 
now they did. According to an ex-coach from Haverford, most alumni go on to become great fathers and husbands and give back to the prep school in the form of money or time. But instead of those things, the duo was going to give back drugs. In October 2013, Neil and Timothy officially began the mainline takeover project and got off to a decent start. Neil successfully recruited two lacrosse friends right off the bat, a 23-year-old named Chester Simmons and, as we saw before, a 23-year-old named Stocky Euler. Timothy, on the other hand, brought in an 18-year-old senior at Haverford named Dan McGrath a guy Timothy described as a highly motivated poor kid. Just convinced my Haverford guy to build his empire and stop Gramps. Sounds good to me, like those kinds of kids. But of course, these kids weren't the only ones dealing. Neil and Timothy were putting an equal, if not more effort to push product. And the kids that came by home base to cop knew they weren't fucking around. One kid who bought from them remembered climbing up the creaky wooden staircase of Neil's apartment and entering his living room to see the ounce of weed he was buying next to a nine millimeter handgun. He had his guns out in plain view, the guy recalls. White kids see a gun, myself included, and they're not going to cause a problem. Now, personally, I wouldn't be the type of guy to keep buying drugs from a crackhead looking fellow with a gun, but this threatening aura seemed to work. Over the first few months in operation, the mainline takeover project was going precisely as planned. Timothy kept supplying his 18-year-old senior, and Neil would drive ounces to Lafayette and Gettysburg College to supply Chester and Stocky while also continuing their efforts to recruit more high school kids. Timothy and Neil were drooling at the opportunity on their hands, and they were already dreaming bigger. I don't know what you make in a week, but I want to make $2,000 if I do this. And there are still a lot of holes to fill because I have to grow my business. I'll be straight with you on how I flip it, and we can work out the numbers. I'll help you with whatever I can. 2000 is definitely feasible. Like I said, I'm trying to start a business and I'm learning how to run this one well. Just have to find the right people and don't rush it. Everything has a way of falling into line. Yeah, the question is, can I find the right guy that can run that operation? And it turns out they found a ton more people that could do it. Timothy and Neil were getting really good at recruiting more people into their operation and expanding their network of sub dealers. Timothy took a more good cop approach, offering to help dealers wherever they needed it while being ultra professional with his interaction. Actions. And by professional, I mean like legit business professional. He would visit various high schools in the main line, such as Lower Marion, Radnor, and Harriton, and woo high schoolers while wearing a full blown suit and playing up the bling aspect of his trade. While showing these kids the large amounts of pot he had, he would convince them to join the operation by offering drugs on credit and being very relaxed with his enforcement. My main line takeover project is coming together fast, and I'm telling all of my guys I never want their schools to be dry, cause I always got pissed as shit when I couldn't find butt. This last week made me realize how much I love money. Yes, he would keep in close contact with his guys and make sure there was never a drought of drugs within his high schools, but he never issued any threats unlike Neil. This man took a way more aggressive approach, constantly pushing his guys to identify new customers and carrying a menacing tone when they didn't do what he wanted. You have a thousand dollar bounty on your head. I will find you. Piece of shit. Heard you ripped off more people on your campus. Between the nice guy and dickhead approach, the duo was quickly expanding into many more high schools and colleges. They tapped into five different high schools and three colleges while recruiting nine total sub dealers in the process. Not bad for being in business for only four months. With their now enlarged network of drug dealing kids and more money coming in from offering different products like cocaine and ecstasy, the guys couldn't have been happier with how things were going. When you were a senior at Haverford, did you ever think you could pull that? Only dreamed it. There is a much bigger market than just a pound at each of these schools. Conestoga alone is a couple a week. Neil and Timothy finally had a sense of accomplishment in their life. All of their hardships were in the past, and now all they could think about doing was tackling more schools, slinging more drugs and growing the mainline takeover project as much as they could. This operation was everything they could have asked for, but in the blink of an eye, it all came crumbling down. It turns out that while the duo was actively growing their operation, the Montgomery County's narcotics enforcement team was actively building a case against them. In January 2014, less than two months after the genesis of the mainline takeover project, the NET was hot on their trail, piecing together their operation from the ground up. And it wasn't a hard one to piece together, 
at all. You see, Timothy and Neil might have had a great education in the traditional sense, but they didn't grow up as drug dealers. Simply put, they had absolutely no fucking clue how to run a drug operation. Sure, they were recruiting sub-dealers fast and moving weight quickly, but they didn't think about protecting themselves at all. All of their sub-dealers used their personal cell phones to communicate phones that were easy to track down by the NET after they received some anonymous tips. The team was able to pinpoint four of the duo sub-dealers and set up controlled drug buys to capture them. The first was a 17-year-old nicknamed MGM, who was known for flexing his shoe collection and posting about his drug dealing on Instagram. How dumb can you get? When MGM's controlled buy took place, he tried to save Grace by launching his jars of weed out of his childhood bedroom but the jars literally landed in the arms of a detective and he was arrested shortly after. The remaining three dealers were successfully caught too, and according to police, all of them admitted to dealing, sending incriminatory text messages, and would later snitch on Neil and Timothy. The NET now had more than enough information to confront the duo. Timothy was up first and was shell-shocked when detectives knocked on his childhood home and arrested him on February 28th, 2014. Luckily for him, he didn't really have much on him, just a pound of kush, and 800 bucks. But Neil's bust was a different story. The detective seized about 8 pounds of marijuana, 23 grams of cocaine, 11 grams of ecstasy, 3 grams of hash oil, and 11,000 in cash from Neil, along with three books about massively successful drug rings. Books that I would assume he never touched. After the dust had settled from their arrest, the NET finally had time to go through both the guy's cell phones, collecting a treasure trove of incriminating information from their text messages. They found communications about everything, from texts about meeting up with dealers, how much they were going to pay, all the different kinds of drugs they sold, and much more. Their cell phones revealed the entire scope of their business, and when April 21st, 2014 rolled around, it was finally time for them to face the music. On that spring afternoon, Timothy was the first to arrive at the courthouse in Ardmore, a mile east of Haverford High School. His partner showed up shortly after, looking much more pissed off. Get the fuck out of my face. Fuck you. Timothy Neal and nine suspected sub-dealers, along with two juveniles, stood in front of the judge on counts much more severe than dealing pot. They were charged with manufacturing and delivering controlled substances, criminal conspiracy, and dealing in a corrupt organization, among other drug-related charges. And the community of Haverford was dumbfounded. The duo's parents were in no rush to talk to anyone, with both families slamming their front doors in the face of reporters as a clear sign. Some people in their lives, however, were more open to speaking. It's crushing to me. These guys are not too far removed from the program. I feel bad for their families. It's a sad day. It's the ultimate backstab. We couldn't have done more for this kid, and it was thrown back in our face. Buried at the core of this scandal, the Haverford School tried to remain quiet. They instructed staff to stay silent and would postpone interviews left, right, and center to avoid speaking up about the situation. But it seemed like they were saving their statement for the graduating class of 2014. I'll briefly just touch on the subject that's been the subject of more media than I could ever imagine. And I'll declare from this stage and from any pulpit that I can get that the Haverford School will not will not be defined by the bad decisions of a few people. We as a community, all the faculty, all the parents, all the students will not let that happen. We will fight to continue to earn our well-deserved outstanding reputation as an extraordinary school with remarkable boys. The scandal that rocked Haverford wasn't just about drugs. It was about the stunning contrast between the privilege and promise of the duo and the choices they made. As one of Timothy's friends told the Washington Post, this is a huge story because of the prestige of the schools involved. It's the uniqueness of the perpetrators. You see, these weren't kids who just grew up on the streets with nothing to lose. These were kids from affluent families in affluent neighborhoods who were given access to one of the best educations in the country. And that's what makes this story so interesting. Neil and Timothy had every advantage in life, supportive families, access to elite schooling, a head start most people would dream of and yet they threw it all away. Instead of leveraging their education to follow traditional paths to success, they chose to take a detour into drug dealing, believing they could build a Pablo Escobar level drug ring. But it wasn't their ambition that led to their downfall. It was their profound miscalculation, thinking that they could blend their privileged upbringing with the reckless world of drug dealing, without realizing they were wholly unprepared for what they were getting into, 
and the repercussions of their actions spoke to that. A little while later, in October of the same year, Timothy and Neil pled guilty to all of their charges, and their final court appearance later that month would be the day they finally got sentenced. But it ended up not being so bad for one of them. That day was a lot different than their initial appearance in April. While the scandal was still piping hot back then, it had cooled down a lot at this point, with barely any reporters covering the sentencing. What seemed to have taken their place was family. Timothy's family to be exact, who were all there in support. And it wasn't just his father, mother, and brother. It was everyone in his life. His therapist, his boss, his Alcoholics Anonymous sponsor. Around 50 people came out to support and speak on behalf of the 19-year-old defendant and their touching stories really resonated with the judge. Timothy was given a very light sentence for his crimes, only 9 to 23 months in county jail and 5 years probation. Unlike Neil, who had nowhere near the same support and received 5 to 15 years in state prison. And better yet, Timothy finally didn't take his lucky situation for granted. While being in jail for 7 and a half months, surrounded by more drug use than ever, he got completely sober by sticking with healthy habits like working, exercising, writing letters, and maintaining contact with his extensive support system. An impressive feat, considering he had been drinking and doing drugs since he was 14. Upon his release, he was accepted into a new college, a school called Cabrini, where he made the lacrosse team and even won a D3 national championship. After graduating in 2019, he founded Synergy Houses, two sober living homes for men, and regularly speaks about his story of dealing drugs and his path to sobriety to this day. Neil, on the other hand, is likely still serving his lengthy prison sentence, as there's been no info publicly released suggesting otherwise. 